Thank you. Okay, let's look at Acts chapter 2 uh, together. Now, I want you to imagine that you are a, a bookmaker in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. What odds would you give that the small band of people who followed Jesus of Nazareth, crucified 50 days ago, would one day plant their flag in every country on earth? What odds would you give to the Jews, to the local people, what the Christians believe is blasphemy, worthy of death, to the Greeks, to everybody else, it's total nonsense, unscientific. So why, despite all the odds, has the Christian church filled the whole world? Why are people still coming to Christ after all this time? Why has Jesus never, ever, ever gone out of fashion in 2,000 years? Well, we can trace the answer to these questions right back to this chapter in Acts that Sue has just read <laughs> and the events that happened outside a little house in Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. For the only explanation for the growth of the church of Jesus Christ is there must be some supernatural power behind the message that it preaches, that defies all the odds. Why else do so many people, even today, hear this message about Jesus and believe it? Even when all logic says they never ever should. What is it about this gospel of Jesus Christ that defies all the odds and keeps bringing people to the Lord Jesus and into the community of his church. And I'm going to leave you with three things this morning. Why that is, why the gospel is so life transforming and how it can transform you. And the first thing is because the Christian gospel a speech that confirms, verse 1 to 4. The Christian gospel is speech that confirms. Now, sometimes I'm, I'm driving with my children, and the car stops, and they say, why aren't we moving, Dad? And I say, well, because the lights are at red. What does red mean? Stop, they say. Wait. What does green mean? Go. Now remember, Jesus said to his disciples in, in chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in not many days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus has been raised from the dead, and within 50 days, just 50 days, Something miraculous, something life transforming would happen to those 12 men. But until then, Jesus says, the light is at red. It is wait. Don't move from Jerusalem. Stay where you are. God is going to create something new, something living, something powerful from what Jesus did on the cross. This violent wind, the tongues of fire, the foreign language sermons. It's like God saying, wherever you are, wherever you go, whoever you speak my word to, I am with you in all my power. He says in chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem locally, in Judea, a bit further away, and right to the ends of the earth. Well, that's an amazing promise, isn't it? You know, it's as if God says at Pentecost, yes, there's a magnificent temple over there in Jerusalem, but 
I've moved out of there. The curtain has been torn in two. It's vacant. My place now is with the church, with ordinary Christians on gospel mission. That's where I'll be in all my power and strength and glory and authority. Now, if the church is God's temple today, as Jesus says it is, and as Pentecost shows us, if the living God is in our midst, what does that say about the church? What does it say about our services? What does it say about how we treat one another as Christians? What does it say about what you do with your body if God lives among us and in us? If the Holy Spirit makes the holy church, should it not be treated in a holy way? Not like everything else in our life. Should it not be treated as special, as a first priority? Should it not be valued and cared for? How do you treat your church? Do you value it as something special? Is it worthy of your time, of your energy, of your commitment? Doesn't Pentecost show us how very, very special the church is? Now, did you know, and you should know because Ollie prayed about it and we sung about it, did you know that the word that's translated spirit can be translated also wind or breath? Imagine a little baby in the womb all squashed up and, and silent in its mum's belly. But when that baby comes out, what happens? All the air from the room round about just rushes up its nose and into its lungs and fills those lungs and that baby lets out a huge scream to tell us all that it's alive and here and has got a lot to say. And Pentecost is just like the Holy Spirit coming and filling the church's spiritual lungs with air that she might shout the gospel message, not just to the streets around, but right to the ends of the earth. And did you know that every time you tell somebody about Jesus here in Derby, in Alistair, you confirm the words of Jesus Christ. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, even to Derby. The light is no longer at red, is it? It is now green for go, a big, bright green. It is time now to get out and shout for Jesus. It is time to go with the gospel. It is time to speak to the nations about Christ. We are in the green time, not the red time. And if you know the Lord Jesus, will you play your part in that great work? Will you pray? Will you give? Will you speak? Will you go? Pentecost happened uh, on the Old Testament Feast of Weeks. It was a harvest festival. When the first fruits were offered to God, oh, there was a greater harvest coming, but when the first fruits came through, you offered them to God. And so here we see the first fruits in Pentecost of, a, of an even greater harvest. And this is important because some people read Acts 2 and they say, we need to go back to Acts 2. That was the great time of the church. But Acts 2 is a sign of greater things to come. Acts 2 is only the first fruits. Acts 2 points us forward. 
So why not think big about God? Think big about mission. Don't think back. Think big. Think big about the church. If Acts 2 is the first fruits, and it's amazing Acts 2, but if that is only the first fruits, what's the full harvest going to be like? If there were great opportunities for the gospel then, what is it like now? We've got Bible translations, we've got the internet, we've got jet travel, we've got mass immigration. There's never been a time like now for people to hear the gospel. People in nations that for years, centuries, have been close to it. See, the world today is full of opportunities for the gospel, isn't it? Will you look for those opportunities? Remember, Pentecost is only the start of world mission. It's not the end. There's still lots of people still to hear. Now, why did all this happen? Why did these great things take place? The simple answer is because Jesus said it would. Doesn't the speech, doesn't the, the speech of Pentecost confirm the speech of Jesus? If Jesus got it right about Pentecost and the growth of the church and world mission, if Jesus got it right about those things, what about everything else that Jesus said? What about everything that Jesus said about himself? What about everything Jesus said about you and me and about sin and repentance and salvation and heaven and hell? What about the things Jesus said about those things? Do you think Jesus might have been right about those things too? And what if he is right about those things. What does that mean for you this morning? Pentecost shows us about speech that confirms, confirms the words of Christ. And secondly, verse 5 to 13, the gospel has spread because it is speech that connects, not only confirms, but also connects. Now, all over the world, isn't English a language that connects? If you know, if English is your first language, you're very privileged because so many people in the world speak it. 2,000 years ago, the English of the ancient world was Greek. That's how they would all communicate. They would all have their own language, their own dialect. But when you came together and tried to communicate with others, you would speak in Greek. And the Feast of Pentecost drew in Jews, Jewish people from all over the world to Jerusalem. And like many foreign tourists to Britain, they would struggle with a, a strong northern accent. Trust me, it's true. <laughs> Yet what do they say when they hear these disciples speaking? What do they say? Verse 7, utterly amazed, he asked, aren't all those, these who are speaking Galileans, they're northerners? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language, our dialect? We hear them declaring the words of God in our own tongues. Amazed, perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? We hear them declaring God's wonders in our own dialect. It's speech that connects. Isn't that amazing? You don't have to learn a foreign language to hear God's word. You can hear it in your own language, your heart language, your dialect. You don't have to stick to the Queen's English, do you? Remember Pentecost. 
See, don't the, the supernatural events of Pentecost, they, they point us to the work of preachers and Bible translators who take the gospel to people in what? In their own language. They don't say, you have to learn English first or Greek or Hebrew, and then we'll teach you the gospel. No, the, language, the gospel comes to them in their own language. Now, you don't even have to go overseas to do this. Even here in Derby, don't you have people whose first language is Polish, Farsi, Merpuri, and loads of other languages? You wouldn't even need to leave home. Think about it. You wouldn't even need to give up your job to use those languages to, to tell people about Jesus. Why not try learning a, a, a Bible verse in a foreign language or a phrase even? I'm sure you'll meet somebody who would just love to hear you saying it. I remember when I was 19, I was in a, a mission in Northern Ireland, and there was a Spanish boy in the team, and I said, Juan, can you teach me John 3.16 in Spanish? And he did. And by the end of the mission, I'd learned it. I've used it many, many times over the years. I met a Spanish person, oh, I know Spanish, and I reel off John 3.16. <laughs> Very effective. But it's one thing to hear the message, isn't it? It's another thing what you do with it. And look how there are two different responses here. To some, this sounded like Babel, the Tower of Babel reversed. Because look how people are drawn to Christ because the speech connects. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? But to some, it sounds like Babel revisited. The speech confuses. And so they reject it. Verse 13, they made fun of them and said, they've had too much booze. Now, how are you hearing this message this morning? Are you saying, I'm listening to that preacher and what he's saying chimes with me. I get what he's saying about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. There must be something in it. I'm curious. I need to know more. Or are you saying, that's a load of nonsense. How can anybody believe that? I've heard more sense from the guys down the pub. On which side of the divide are you as you hear the gospel this morning? As you hear God's word? Is the speech that connects connecting with you? Or are you disconnected? This is speech, the gospel is speech that confirms the words of Jesus. And this is speech that connects with those who believe the words of Jesus. And then thirdly and finally, very importantly, this is speech that converts. Verse 14 to 21. Now, it's never easy to speak of Christ, is it, when people are laughing at you? So look at Peter's courage here now. What a change the Holy Spirit makes. Peter's no longer a chicken. Peter's a lion. Now, you might think, couldn't Peter have picked an easier Bible passage for his sermon if I was preaching for the first time to an audience, I don't think I would go to Joel chapter 2. What's all this about wonders in heaven and signs on earth and blood and fire and billows of smoke? Well, last year when, when the queen died, the world seemed to go all quiet, didn't it? It was all very solemn and dignified when the queen died. But when Jesus dies, it's as if God takes the cosmos and gives it a good shake. The sun turns dark at midday, doesn't it? There's a violent earthquake. Graves are opened and people walk out. And now there's this wind and fire and uneducated people talking foreign languages. Why? Because this is a new day. 
This is the great and glorious day of the Lord. This is the start of the last days. Jesus has died for our sins. And now everyone who calls in the Lord's name will be saved. They will be converted. Look at verse 17. Who will receive God's spirit and speak his word? Who will utter his speech? In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, all those who know the Lord. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men, they'll dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Sons, daughters, children, young people, old people, men, women, all can share God's word. All can speak of Christ. You don't need to say, well, go and speak to the pastor. He'll tell you about Christ. You can tell them. You can speak for the Lord. Older people, you can speak of Christ. Maybe you think, my best days are behind me. I I sometimes wonder why I'm still here. Let me tell you, if you're not dead, you're not done. Didn't we hear last week from a man, he's 87 this year, and he's still speaking of Christ, isn't he? Young people, you can speak of Christ. Ladies, too, and men. Sometimes the ladies are better at speaking of Christ than the men are. But both can. You don't need to be a leader in the church. You don't need a theology degree. You don't need to have done special training or have gone to classes. (laughs) If you belong to Christ, you can speak of Christ. For you have the Holy Spirit. And isn't he all that you need? And if you've heard God's word, how have you responded? Let me ask you this morning, have you called in the name of the Lord? Have you said, Lord, save me? For let me assure you that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who you've been with, If you call in the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's the promise of God's word. You don't need to know all the answers about the Christian faith. You just need to feel your need of the Lord and call in his name. Forgive me, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I come to you, Lord. I give my life to you, Lord. I want to follow you for the rest of my days, Lord. Have you said that to the Lord? Have you called in his name? Have you been converted? Well, isn't this the time to do that? Because these are the last days, says Joel. Days that fulfill all that's gone before. The whole history of the world has been leading up to these days that we are in. Days of great opportunity to come to Christ. Great days. But limited days. Because they're the last days. And so will you hear this message with faith? Not with fun, but with faith. Will you come to Christ before it's too late? Will the speech that converts convert you this morning?